Okay, I think that we should get started. Um, thanks, everybody. Um, welcome. I'm Kevin Ruther, MCEA's Chief Legal Officer. And I want to thank you for joining us in this second webinar in our series um, of continuing legal education programs. We're calling it the Green Beagle. Um, today, we're going to take up mining. And this program has been approved for one CLE credit. So you can register that on OASIS, the credit code is 391477. And I think that that might be posted in the chat too. So with me today are Catherine Hoffman and Ann Cohen. Hi, Catherine and Ann. Hello. Um, Catherine, I think folks know is MCA's CEO. And prior to taking that leadership role, she was a staff attorney for many years at MCA and actually was our lead on all of our mining cases, um, has so has spent a lot of time thinking about working on PolyMet. <laughs> and Anne joined us in um, 2018, right Anne? After 30 some years as an assistant attorney general working for the state and primarily working for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. So it's been great to have her on our staff and um, she's primarily taken over the lead on all of our, uh, our PolyMet litigation and our mining litigation in general. So is also very well versed in the topic for today. So what we have outlined, um, well, first of all, I should say that what we had outlined had to change because we got a decision on Monday, um, which you may have noticed, uh, reported on in the Star Tribune above the flap on the first page. So that was kind of nice on PolyMet's air permit, which has been sent back to the PCA uh, from the Court of Appeals. So we want to have some time to talk about that. Um, but in general, what we're gonna do is Catherine's gonna get us started, um, provide some history and context to legal advocacy on mining issues, touch, talk a little bit about the difference between iron ore mining, which we've had for years, and this new kind of mining, which we call sulfide mining for copper and nickel and other metals. Um, and then Anne is going to do a deeper dive into Minnesota's mining regulations um, and really talk about the law. And then I wanna spend some time at the end talking about primarily two cases that we've had that were decided by the Minnesota Supreme Court this year um, and give you a bit of an update on some of our other polymet litigation. Um, we wanna save time for your questions. We'll be using the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. If you if a question comes up for you during the presentation, please put it in there and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. Um, so I think I've covered everything and we'll kick it off with Catherine. We do have a PowerPoint, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, there we go. All right, well, Kevin does that. I'll start talking. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> thanks, Kevin. Yeah. All right, um, so I wanna talk just a little bit about kind of the history of mining and where we sit today. Um, I do wanna, pause and talk a little bit about MCA and some new work we're doing, which is that we have uh, launched a new program called the Northeast Minnesota Program. This is kind of how our work is organized. So we have a climate program that focuses on reducing greenhouse gas emissions in Minnesota. We have a water program that focuses on water pollution more broadly across the state. And uh, we put a lot of resources into agricultural runoff because that's the biggest source of water pollution in the state. And it also became clear to us that we have um, some of Minnesota's most valued and undisturbed resources in Northern Minnesota, but also some of the greatest challenges upcoming um, in terms of mining and forest management, threats to Lake Superior and so forth. So we fashioned a program around this region called the Northeast Minnesota Program. Um, and the primary goals of this program are to um, protect Northeast Minnesota communities and waters from mining pollution, particularly sulfide mining that we're talking about today, um, to protect and enhance our lands, forests, and biodiversity in Northeast Minnesota for resilience in climate change, and then also to really ground our advocacy in the local folks. So we've opened a Duluth office um, and want to make sure that we have great relationships with people in the communities in Northeast Minnesota, as well as um, the tribes that have uh, reservations as well as treaty rights um, across the region. So um, that's a new focus of our work that I wanted to share with you today. 
Now I'm going to shift um, into mining specifically. Why, as an environmental group, are we focused on mining? Um, you might know that we've had mining in Minnesota for 100 years, probably, which is, uh, and that's been iron mining. Um, and iron mining is um, at least it's different than sulfide mining and at least potentially not as polluting. But even with iron mining, the state has had a lot of trouble regulating this industry. So, you know, this picture that we're looking at on the front page of the slideshow that Kevin is showing is a picture of the reserve mining site. And this was a location where a mining company was, um, you know, digging up ore and then processing it and removing um, the ferrous or the iron materials to go into steel. And then what was left over is a lot of water and ground up materials called tailings. That's how we refer to mining waste as tailings. And what this company was doing at the reserve site was just pumping that into Lake Superior. And that's not great for Lake Superior. And in particular, there are a lot of uh, particles at the site that are similar to asbestos, um, asbestiform fibers they're referred to. And it wasn't really clear, you know, what the impacts of putting those into the water were, but uh, it can't be good. And so there was quite a lot of litigation um, over this and some of MCA's find founding uh, members were very involved in that litigation. Um, and it resulted in an uh, administrative law case coming out of the Minnesota Supreme Court that um, we, you may have cited, if you're an administrative lawyer, that set the standard in terms of how we review uh, agency decisions with language about hard look and danger signals, uh, legal language that's familiar to you if you're in that practice area. Um, but it was, that was a long fought battle. Kevin, if you wanna show the next slide. I don't expect you to absorb this, but this is just to give you a sense of the length and the number of cases that we went through that were by environmental lawyers, not me personally, but earlier environmental lawyers um, on the reserve mining case. And these are just the federal cases. This actually doesn't, this string site doesn't even involve state cases. So it gives you a sense of how hard fought these battles have been in Minnesota's history. Um, in the next slide, Kevin, more recently, um, there are issues with a U.S. steel site called Mintac. Mintac is, I think, the biggest uh, taconite mine in Minnesota. It has a huge storage facility called a tailings basin for its waste. And the primary issue of Mintac is that that big storage facility is leaking. So it's unlined, it's got a bunch of water mixed with the mine waste in it and about 2,000 to 3,000 gallons per minute of polluted water leak out of the bottom of that thing and into nearby lakes and rivers. Um, very close by are some historic wild rice sites that are uh, very valued by um, the uh, Ojibwe bands and have pretty much been decimated because the pollution, specifically the sulfate coming out of that site is very problematic. Um, and so we brought a suit in 2014 um, when they were expanding to try to get them to do some environmental review and look at this pollution problem. Um, that was not successful, um, but they did say that they would reissue the water quality permit, which was um, at that point already decades overdue. And they did reissue that permit a few years ago, but it wasn't very good in our view or in the band's view. And so there's litigation over that as well. And that's that second case. So that's iron mining. Um, and so that hasn't been easy. And I think there's some reason to believe that the agencies have struggled to effectively regulate this industry. Um, you know, in particular, once a mine is up and running, it's very hard to force it to change things because they quickly play the card of, you know, if you make us do things differently um, or clean up our act, we will close and then there will be fewer jobs in the range. And, um, you know, that has been effective in political contexts. So, um, and now we're facing a new uh, type of mining, which we referred to as uh, sulfide mining. So sulfide mining includes mining for copper, nickel, platinum, palladium, sometimes gold, um, sometimes cobalt. They're basically a whole family of minerals that are typically found embedded in sulfide bearing ore. And sulfide bearing ore is problematic because when it's brought to the surface, it's ground up and exposed to air and water in the processing, um, it can go acidic. That's called acid mine drainage and it's a particularly problematic 
uh, thing that happens at these sites, uh, both for people and for, as you might imagine, ecosystems nearby, because that's acid. <laughs> um, in addition, it's an industry that doesn't have a great track record. We really don't have good examples of sulfide mines that haven't caused problems or polluted. Um, you know, the ones that want to build here are always saying they'll be the first. Maybe they will, but they would be the first. So that's kind of a concerning history. Um, and then there's the issue of, you know, really forever pollution. So once this ore is dug up and it's processed, um, and even if it doesn't become acidic, it's basically a source of pollution for all time. Uh, there's no point at which, you know, things sort of wash out and the site becomes more benign, or if there is, no one's been able to identify that. Um, you know, the company's own models tend to show that, you know, they're looking at, you know, pollution for hundreds of years. And that means for hundreds of years at the site, either it pollutes or, you know, there has to be some very active management going on to prevent that. Collecting water, uh, a big wastewater treatment plant, um, which raises the question of how do you pay for that? Because a forever wastewater treatment plant is uh, pretty expensive. So those are the main concerns. And more than that, um, to show you what this map shows, sorry, it's just like going over and over. Um, the, what we're trying to demonstrate here is the interest in our, in our mineral deposits here in Minnesota. So the copper nickel deposits are spread pretty widely throughout Northeast Minnesota. Um, and the um, Polymet is the company that's sought the first permits but there's a bunch of other companies that are really interested. And so what this show is showing is leases where people are doing active exploration for sulfide minerals to find out, hey, do I wanna build a mine here? And so um, when the cycle starts in a moment, it starts in 1990, right here. And then three years later, three years later, three years later, and so on. And I think the map goes up to about 2015. Um, and I'm sure there's probably even more since then. And what it's showing is that as time has gone on, copper prices have gone up, more and more com companies are interested in our deposits here in Minnesota. Um, so that means that polymet is a really big deal because we have this whole set of laws that apply only to sulfide mining and not to taconite mining. Um, that have, it's, it's a whole set of rules, chapter 6132 of the Minnesota rules, and that's, that stuff's never been interpreted before. So the state agencies are interpreting those laws for the first time and applying polymath. So all these other companies, all these little colored dots you're seeing, all eyes are on polymath. And they're asking the question, you know, how is the, uh, how is the state going to treat their proposals. This is going to be like a friendly jurisdiction, basically, to build these kinds of mines, or is it not? Um, we at MCA are asking slightly different questions. Kevin, if you want to go to the next slide, which is, are we are we ready for this? Are our environmental laws up to the task to manage this, you know, potentially very damaging industry? And are our state and federal agencies up to the task of regulating these big industries? Because these are big global corporations that operate in a lot of jurisdictions. Um, you know, they're not necessarily easy to manage and they are pretty good at lobbying and lowering standards and influencing how laws are interpreted. So we're concerned about that. And so is this Lynx that lives up near the polymed site. So this curious Lynx is gonna hand it off to Anne, who's gonna talk to us about um, the answers to these questions. Thanks very much, Catherine, for that great introduction. And Kevin, if you can flip to the next slide. So yes, are our agencies up to the task of managing this new, more risky kind of ore? Um, and the agencies that we have uh, that have oversight duties, regulatory duties, whoops, can you go back? Yes, thanks, Kevin. Um, are, of course, the DNR, uh, which issues the main permit to mine, dam safety permits, water appropriation, wetlands, endangered plants and animals work in the water, MPCA, water discharge permits, construction permits, air quality, greenhouse gases um, as part of air quality, solid waste, but not tailings disposal, 
hazardous waste, of course, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Federal Wetlands, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, endangered species like the lynx, and other federal agencies, including EPA, which exercises oversight primarily of MPCA, uh, but also federal agency environmental review. So we have a lot of agencies that are involved in this. Next slide. But we're going to focus today on the DNR uh, because DNR is the central agency here in the state of Minnesota for mine permitting. And other agencies essentially have to dance uh, to the tune that DNR has called when it approves a particular mining proposal. Um, and DNR's rules are the ones that are specific to mining and statutes are specific to mining, whereas the other agency rules are not specific to mining. They just apply, for example, generally to air quality or to water quality. So today we're going to focus on the DNR and its authorities. Next slide, please. So I thought we should start at the top which is what is our policy as articulated by the legislature uh, with regard to mining. Um, and chapter 93 of our state statutes is where you find the mining regulations primarily. And it starts right off with a bang with this uh, policy statement 93.001, the policy for mineral development. But if you'll note, I have thrown in the title the year when this particular policy was adopted, which is 1987. So this policy um, obviously says we are supporting diversification of the state's mineral economy. We're supporting exploration, evaluation. There's a little suggestion, a uh, hint of environmental concern, but mostly development, production, and commercialization. So as a state, our policy is we support mining for its economic benefits. Next slide, please. But in the same chapter, there is an older policy adopted in 1969, 93.44, Declaration of Policy. And this one reads a little differently in recognition of the effects of mining on the environment. It is hereby declared to be the policy of this state to provide for reclamation uh, and the skipping down to control possible adverse environmental effects of mining, preserve natural resources, et cetera, et cetera. And then we get, again, a little flavor of the other policy while at the same time promoting orderly development of mining, uh, encouragement of good mining practices, and the recognition and identification of the beneficial aspects of mining. I call this um, balance and battleground. So we have two different policies in the chapter governing mining, and they're somewhat at tension with one another. Next slide, please. So DNR is the agency that has a lot of programs and duties with regard to mining. You saw Catherine's slide concerning mineral leasing sites. We have 12 million acres in the state that are potentially leasable for mining exploration. And DNR, um, as you can see, has an active mining uh, mineral leasing program. Not going to talk about that today. That could be a whole CLE unto itself. DNR, DNR does some research and development. I don't know how active this is, but in the past, DNR uh, had staff that were scientists who were devoted to looking at issues with regard to reclamation. DNR is the agency with the rulemaking duty and authority over mining and the permitting duty and authority over mining, at least as to specific mining permits. So it issues the permit to mine and that often comes with a dam safety permit because of the, the uh, common practice of disposing of that wet slurry of tailings that you saw in that first wonderful picture of what we thought was acceptable back in the 1970s, which is just a slurry, the whole mess into Lake Superior. Now, at least we put it into a tailings basin, but that can involve dikes and dams and dam safety permits and requirements. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, Kevin. <laughs> Thanks. Um, 
So again, balance and battleground. So this isn't the whole of this statute, um, but the DNR is required to adopt rules. And in adopting those rules, you see again this balance, this tension inside our mining laws where the commissioner is supposed to give due consideration to the effects of mining on the obvious things, right? The environment, the future use of the land, uh, the protection of natural resources, but part B, the commissioner shall also give due consideration to the future economic effect of such regulations and employment and future mining and development and practical problems of mine operators. So you see within the duties of the commissioner in its rules, again, the balance and the battleground. Next slide, please. So again, uh, DNR rules governing mining, uh, 9347 subdivision three, uh, to the greatest extent possible. Within the authority possessed by the commissioner, the rules so promulgated shall comply with federal rules. But guess what? Federal rules don't exist. That never happened. So when this statute was adopted, they thought that the federal government was going to do something like the Clean Water Act or the Clean Air Act for mining, but that never happened. So there are no national standards. It's a state by state situation. And the only national standards that apply are to coal mining. So we're out of that game. Um, but I've highlighted some uh, areas here because this gets into another very interesting theme of the legislative authority uh, that became very important in our polymet litigation that, that Kevin will uh, discuss after my presentation. So the rules so promulgated um, shall conform to state and local land use planning, okay, but provided further, the commissioner shall develop procedures that will identify areas or type of areas which, if mine, cannot be reclaimed with existing techniques to satisfy the rules. And the commissioner will not issue permits to mine such areas until the commissioner determines that technology is available. Okay, mark those words. Existing technique, technology is available because you're going to hear them again. Next slide. So DNR issues the master permit, which is called the permit to mine. And this is in 9341, same chapter, and there's a prohibition, right? Don't mine without a permit. And what must the permit, uh, what must the applicant do to get this permit? Well, the heart of it is a reclamation plan. Right, we're not going to permit you to start a mine without a reclamation plan. Next slide. Um, but again, remember those words in the rulemaking section. Um, we have a, a procedural requirement. So when the uh, application is complete and filed, the commissioner has to make a decision on the permit. Okay, that's nothing new. Can be modified. It can be denied unless a contested case hearing is requested or ordered, in which case the decision comes later. So that's nothing surprising. But again, we have some language that I'll call, you, call to your attention because there aren't a lot of statutes, uh, standards in law for when these permits are granted or denied, but here you go, here it is. The commissioner in granting a permit with or without modifications shall determine that the reclamation or restoration complies with lawful requirements can be accomplished under available technology and that the proposed reclamation or restoration technique is practical and workable under available technology. So you can see that the legislature was obviously very concerned about a particular problem, which is that we would essentially let slip the dogs of mining without having a doghouse, without having knowing how this all is gonna end. We need a reclamation plan and we need it under existing technology, not under hopes and dreams. Next slide. So other statutory requirements attach the permit to mine a term. And so the commissioner has the duty in issuing this permit to grant the, uh, the, the permit for the term determined necessary by the commissioner for the completion of the proposed mining operation, including reclamation or restoration. And this was another issue that ended up getting litigated during our polymet case. 
Um, and the, the term is important because during the term, the permit cannot be revoked. And here's another little theme that you'll see in our statutes that's very unique to mining in my experience, that mining permits are theoretically irrevocable during their term. Um, although they can be modified or revoked, as you can see uh, in subdivision four, if they are in breach, if the, the miner is in breach of the terms and conditions. Next slide, please. So um, the important uh, procedural requirement, you know, so the commissioner is required to issue that permit in 120 days if the application is complete, except if there is a contested case hearing. So this statute uh, was adopted in 2017, so that's fairly recent, but it does reflect prior DNR rules, which were brought forward into the statute. And subdivision one, um, for better or worse, is called the standing requirement. It's confusing for lawyers because we think of other things with regard to standing, but that's what we've started calling this. And it says that any person owning property that will be affected by the proposed operation and federal, state, local governments can ask for a contested case hearing on the completed application. And so this was, again, one of our big fights in PolyMet. DNR had a very narrow view of who a person was affected by the proposed operation. And we were trying to expand uh, that universe. Next slide, please. So the contested case hearing standard, for those of you who have practiced in front of the MPCA, will read very, very familiar to you. It uh, calls on the commissioner to grant the petition, but the commissioner has to make some findings, that there is a material issue of fact and dispute over which the commissioner has jurisdiction. And number three, which tends to be where the battle happens, there is a reasonable basis underlying the disputed material issue of fact, such that, or so that, a contested case hearing would allow the introduction of evidence that would aid the commissioner in resolving disputed facts. And this became a huge issue in our polymet litigation. What does this particular provision mean with regard to the discretion of the agency to grant or deny contested cases? Next slide. So uh, there are rules pursuant to the authority um, that uh, the DNR was granted in 1981. It adopted rules governing ferrous mining, the iron mining, chapter 6130. And in 93, although there were no such mines, the DNR adopted non-ferrous mining rules, chapter 6132. And it's fair to say for both of these rules that with some exceptions, uh, the rules are, let's just say, a lot less detailed than uh, you see in the rules, for example, the technical standards adopted by the MPCA. Next slide. So the other major permit that uh, the DNR must issue, uh, commonly for mining operations, is the dam safety permit and or water use permits. And uh, sometimes the dam is going to impede water or divert drain or control water, uh, sometimes water appropriations, etc. And here again, uh, we have some mining specific language. Uh, the DNR can only grant these permits if they're really necessary, that another feasible and economic method of mining is not available. They cannot endanger public health or safety, and the proposed mining operations will be in the public interest. So here you'll see the other language themes with regard to DNR's authority to permit dams and other water use type permits. Next slide, please. And these are in 103G, which is a more general statute dealing with uh, water uh, that the DNR uh, implements. So subdivision eight, modifying or canceling permit. Here we go again. A permit issued under this section is irrevocable. Okay, what does this mean? I mean, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure as an attorney if I were working through state, what, what does this mean? And at any rate, here the language is um, a little clearer insofar as it does say that the commissioner uh, can, can uh, modify this permit um, if necessary to protect the public health or safety or protect public interest in lands or water against substantial injury. 
So what does it mean to be irrevocable if the commissioner can kind of change his or her mind based on things that the commissioner has learned in the interim? So next slide, please. And again, here we see the theme of adequately protect public safety and promote the public welfare. Commissioner should grant the permit under those conditions. Next slide. And there are specific rules dealing with dams and found in chapter 6115. And again, you see this theme of health, safety, welfare with regard to granting of these permits. Uh, but the rules actually go into a lot more detail. And so for a class one dam, which is one that could have a major adverse effect on the population if it fails. So Polymex Dam, for example, is a class one dam. It's going to be a very high dam, maybe the highest in the state. And if that dam should fail, the tailing should liquefy. That mass will cause considerable adverse effects, both on population and socioeconomic base downstream. So it's a class one dam. And so the commissioner is supposed to determine that the proposal is adequate with respect to the stability of the dam under all conditions based on current prudent engineering practice. So this can change over time as we learn things about dam safety, which we are all the time, uh, what is current, what is prudent, what is a design that would be deemed current and prudent will change. And the degree of conservatism must depend on hazard. So if you have a high hazard dam, you need to hold your design to the highest of engineering standards, the most prudent, the most current. And again, another factor in issuance of a, a dam permit is compliance with prudent, current environmental practice throughout its existence. So will this dam, uh, you know, prevent environmental issues throughout its existence? Next slide. So to sum up uh, the mining regulation, we see that in chapter 93, DNR has a dual mission. It is both tasked with the promotion of this industry for its economic benefits, but also the regulation of this industry uh, to protect our natural resources. We see that DNR has adopted mining rules governing ferrous and non-ferrous mining, chapter 6130 and 6132. Uh, but really, because those rules are written without a lot of detail, the real rubber hits the road in the permit to mine, which the DNR must issue under uh, 93481. The DNR must sometimes convene a contested case hearing. That was at issue in our polymet litigation. And the DNR uh, is tasked with issuing the dam safety permit under chapter 103G, but also these rules that give the detail a little, uh, the DNR a little more detail as to how it evaluates these proposals. So it is fair to say that we learned a lot about how DNR implements these authorities through our polymet cases. And I think it is also fair to say that DNR learns a lot about its own authorities and limitations through our polymed cases. And so now I am going to turn it over to our legal director, Kevin Ruther, to talk about what we learned from our polymed cases. Great, thanks, Anne. Um, that's a lot to absorb. I just wanna pause for a second and remind people that we're gonna use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, so if you have questions for Catherine or Anne at this point, go ahead and type them in there and I'll invite Anne and Catherine to just look at those questions while I'm talking about some of the cases here. Um, so we're doing pretty good on time. I'm, I want to take some time to talk about mainly two cases that went to the Supreme Court this past year. Uh, both were challenges to 
permits issued to Polymet. The first was the permit to mine and dam safety permits, which Ann has just been focusing on. The second was our challenge to PCA's Clean Air Act permit that the Pollution Control Agency issued to the company. Um, and if we have time, I'll also maybe update you a little bit about some other litigation that's related. So first off, the permit to mine and dam safety permits. Um, our, our challenge to these permits really involved many issues, but they kind of fit into two different buckets. Um, the one bucket is about the contested case hearing that Ann mentioned. So uh, the DNR statute has the provision for um, allowing for contested case hearings. Um, and we had petitioned the DNR to have a contested case hearing on many of the issues that we felt were still in dispute about its permit to mine and its dam safety permits. Um, there were two parts to um, this contested case dispute that came out. One was DNR denied our request first based on saying that we didn't have standing. So um, Anne pointed out the statutory provision that's referred to as the standing provision. They said that we and our members didn't meet that. So they denied it for that reason. But they also said under that last provision in Anne's statute there that we had not shown that these uh, a contested case hearing on these issues would aid the commissioner. And so um, the DNR denied that request. There were other issues that are at issue in these cases too, which were more legal challenges to the standards that are in the permits themselves. Um, and so that's kind of the second bucket of issues. This was a certiorari appeal, so it went directly to the Court of Appeals. And we actually had a lot of success at the Court of Appeals um, in this case, basically agreed with almost every one of our arguments. Um, uh, to be honest, they agreed with us that in fact, our members did have standing because they were property owners and they could be affected by the mine. And they rejected DNR's narrow version of what affected by the mine could mean. Uh, so we were certainly able to request the contested case hearing. And then the Court of Appeals agreed with us that um, under this circumstance where we had these competing um, experts and um, where we had really put together what it called probative, competent, and conflicting evidence into the record that a contested case was required. Uh, and so it issued a remand for a contested case on maybe five or six different issues that we had raised. Um, with regard to the legal issues, the Court of Appeals took a pass on most of them except for one, and that being whether or not the rules required the permit to have a fixed term. So DNR had issued a permit that didn't have a term, it was an indefinite permit. Um, the term that they identified was uh, a phrase in the permit that says, you know, when reclamation is completed. Basically, that was the end of the term. And we said that that wasn't sufficient. The Court of Appeals agreed. Well, uh, Polymet and DNR sought review of that decision in the Supreme Court, and the Minnesota Supreme Court took the case and issued a decision this past year that affirmed in part and reversed in part the Court of Appeals. Um, for the most part, it was a a big win for our side. So it agreed that in fact, property owners like our members um, who attest to having uh, 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 any kind of damage from this um, mine would have standing in order to request a, a contested case hearing. What it disagreed about was um, when a contested case hearing would have to be um, granted by the agency. And so the Supreme Court, in its opinion, is it's clear that it's concerned about giving deference to the agency. Um, there is the language in the statute that says that the commissioner gets to determine whether or not it will aid him or her. Um, and so there's a lot of language about making sure that the court isn't stepping into you know, what has been deemed by the legislature agency jurisdiction. Um, and it rejected the, the language of the test that had been adopted by the Court of Appeals and instead said that we're gonna apply a general substantial evidence test standard of review to this decision of the agency to reject a contested case hearing request. Um, it focused on 
how the agency has explained its conclusion in its denial and whether based on the record as a whole, that conclusion was reasonable, which is a standard of review that we're familiar with um, the substantial evidence test. And then it went through each of those five or six issues and determined for the most part that the DNR's record had enough evidence in it to support its determination that it would not be aided by a contested case hearing, except for one really important issue, which was the issue of bentonite. Um, bentonite is essentially clay. Uh, it is uh, going to be used in Polymet's proposed uh, mine tailings basin as a barrier to prevent pollution from leaking out of the tailings basin. And we had shown that essentially the, um, the findings of the agency were not supported by evidence in the record and the Supreme Court agreed with that and so sent this um, back to the agency, the DNR, for, uh, for a contested case hearing minimally on the issue of bentonite. Going to the legal issues, it agreed with the Court of Appeals and with us that the statute requires a fixed term, that you can't just have a permit to mine indefinitely. Um, and so now that this is back at the agency, at the department, um, the DNR is gonna have to figure out how to put a fixed term into this permit if it reissues it. Um, it didn't reach any of the other legal issues uh, that were also not reached by the Court of Appeals. So those are still sort of hanging out there. Um, the question about what's next, we're not really sure. We haven't heard from the DNR. Um, at a minimum, they have to have a contested case on the issue of bentonite and uh, whether or not that's a sufficient barrier. Um, whether it's practicable or practical and workable, I think are the, the terms in the rule. Um, the court said in its opinion that DNR could certainly have a contested case on other issues, it, it could broaden the scope of that contested case. So that's an option. Um, DNR, I think, could possibly delay a decision to have a contested case hearing until some of these other issues are resolved. Um, so as I mentioned, we have a number of other appeals pending and they involve issues that are affected not just by bentonite, um, but by other things that could really be um, evaluated in a contested case hearing. And so one option might be for DNR to delay uh, having the hearing. Another option, and really one that we would promote, is for DNR to simply say to PolyMet, look, you need to take this back and rework this application. Um, there are enough problems with your proposal that I think it's time to go back to the drawing board um, and uh, fix these problems and then reapply for the permit. So um, more later on what's next when we hear more from the DNR on that. It's worth um, noting, Kevin, if, sorry if I could just jump in on that last yeah. option, is that you know, one of the things we've learned is that the permit application itself is, is really the thing that the agency treats as the permit. So they don't go and like write a permit that's a whole separate body of work. There's, I mean, there's, they do issue a document that's a permit, but there's not much in there. The real substance is in what PolyMet applied for, which is a little concerning because it means the mining company sort of did all the work in fashioning what gets approved. But also that's why it's meaningful to send the application back to them is that they need to fashion an application that meets the requirements of the law as the courts interpreted it. Exactly, thanks for clarifying that, Catherine. Um, so this, the other case that I just wanted to spend a couple minutes on is the air permit appeal. So um, this of course is, in, does involve federal law, the Clean Air Act, um, but also state laws that govern air emissions in the state. Um, and in, in, so in this case, again, it was a certiorari appeal, went to the Court of Appeals, up to the Supreme Court, and then the Supreme Court remanded back to the Court of Appeals. And it's that Court of Appeals decision that we just got on Monday um, that I can talk a little bit about. But before I get to the opinion, um, I have to explain some of the issues. So um, PolyMet had applied for what's known as a synthetic minor permit under the Clean Air Act. So the act sets a threshold of emissions at which a facility is considered to be a major source. 
And if you're going to pollute over that threshold and be a major source, there are a set of more stringent regulations and controls that apply to your facility, including the need to comply with BACT, which is best available control technologies. But the, C the, the uh, Clean Air Act also allows facilities that have the potential to emit over this threshold to agree to permits that will limit their emissions to below the threshold. And that's why it's called a synthetic miner. They have the potential to go over, but synthetically they're agreeing to be a miner, not a major source. And by agreeing to those lower pollution amounts, the facility can then avoid the more stringent regulations, including the best available control technology analysis. And so that's what PolyMed, PolyMed did here. It said it would limit its emissions by limiting the amount of ore that it was putting through its facility each day to 32,000 tons per day. And its modeling showed that at that throughput limit, its air emissions wouldn't be that of a major source. And so that's the permit that um, the PCA drafted and issued to PolyMet. Put it out on, uh, PCA put the uh, permit out for public notice. We commented on it. And 10 days after the close of the comment period on that permit, um, PolyMet filed with Canadian security regulators a report that indicated that if it um, doubled or tripled the throughput, in other words, made a much bigger mine or mined much more quickly, it could make a heck of a lot more money, like way more money. Um, and when you looked at the profitability of PolyMet um, at this 32,000 ton per day level was somewhat questionable. Um, that profitability went from, I think, 10% up to like 28% in these other scenarios where it would be operating an expanded mine. Well, we, of course, um, were concerned about that because is this just PolyMet getting its nose under the tent? Um, you know, is it going to be coming back in two years for uh, an expansion? And if so, that's something that the agencies need to be looking at now. And so we put this document along with our expert review of the document, kind of explaining it and the significance of it in front of the agencies. Um, and in fact, we wrote to the PCA and said to them, look, there's this thing in federal law called sham permitting that prohibits what we think PolyMet might be doing here. And so you need to investigate it. Well, PCA responded to that request with a simple letter um, and a day later issued its Clean Air Act permit. Um, it did not in its findings on the permit address any of our concerns about this expansion scenario. The letter that it sent us said, you know, that it didn't, it didn't need to investigate this because the, um, uh, there, there was some language in the report that suggested um, that it was just an analysis. Um, it's not an actual plan. We then um, took that to the Court of Appeals. Um, and again, the Court of Appeals issued a good decision for us. Um, it agreed that this looked like it could be sham permitting under the federal regulations and that sham perm permitting should be investigated before the PCA would issue this permit. And so it remanded it back for findings related to that. Again, the company PolyMet and the agency sought review in the Supreme Court. The court took the case and um, issued a decision this past year. Um, and again, it was mixed, right? It reversed the Court of Appeals, but it remanded to the Court of Appeals. So it reversed on the issue of federal sham permitting, saying that, yes, there are these guidelines and regulations about sham permitting, but really they, they apply to enforcement. Um, after the permit has been issued, if it's found that in fact, a company had the intent to expand and it knew that it was going to do that prior to issuance and came now and wanted a permit amendment, that that could potentially be sham permitting, but that's about enforcement. It's not about the obligation of the agency prior to issuing the permit. So it didn't agree with us on that, on that federal, uh, the interpretation of the federal requirement, but it did remand to the Court of Appeals to investigate the same issue under state law and see whether or not the um, agency should have 
um, built a record for a reviewing court to determine whether or not um, this allegation was substantiated. Um, specifically, uh, it, it pointed to provisions in the, the permitting statute that the PCA had to find that PolyMet would comply with all the conditions of the permit. Um, it also had to find that PolyMet uh, did not fail to disclose fully all the facts that are relevant. And it had to uh, find that PolyMet didn't knowingly submit false or misleading information to the agency. And so it was the remand um, to the Court of Appeals, that decision was, was issued on Monday. And the court basically reaffirmed its earlier decision and said, look, PCA, yeah, you sent this letter a day before issuing the findings, but it doesn't really resolve the problem. It doesn't explain to us why this isn't an issue that you should have investigated. And by the way, there aren't any findings um, when you issued this permit relevant or relative to the allegations that the relators had made. Um, so this is also now the agency has, or the court has remanded to the Pollution Control Agency to fix these problems. Um, let's see, I have a list here of other matters that are pending. I don't think that I'm gonna go into them because we're getting short on time and I wanna make sure that we do have some time for questions. Um, so let me take down the slideshow and jump to Anne. You know, we've mentioned that we've learned some things through the court cases, but we've been working on this administratively for so long. Talk a little bit about what we've learned um, just by being involved so intimately with these mine proposals. Sure, well, I think Catherine has somewhat touched on this a little bit. Sorry. Which is <laughs> that, no, that's fine. Um, you know, the, the, one of the things that we've really come to observe is that there is no permit. Uh, you know, the application goes back and forth between the applicant and the DNR, and they have what they call an iterative process. And, and I, you know, I'm not, this is not bad. I mean, DNR is taking a very careful look at the application, but at some point, DNR just says, okay, good enough. And, and they don't issue a permit in the same way as, for example, the pollution control each agency issues a permit. So an air permit, say, for example, would be 150 pages, very detailed uh, terms and conditions that the permittee must comply with written in enforceable language. And DNR doesn't do that. You know, so it makes it very hard to tell what has actually been allowed with regard to this mine. When must it end? Well, now DNR is gonna to have to tell us. When is the reclamation gonna be complete? DNR is gonna to have to tell us at least that. But, um, you know, when is mining supposed to end? When is, uh, you know, the first closure activity supposed to be done? We don't know, because it's too vague. You know, the permit application isn't written in enforceable language. The permit to shall doesn't appear. Um. Catherine, um, one thing that I wanted to address is this issue that our opponents um, often point to uh, with regard to these metals, in particular, for example, cobalt, which is primarily mined in the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, that you know there are human rights abuses, child labor issues. Why should we be getting our cobalt from Congo when we have a source here in Minnesota? And doesn't that weigh in favor of going forward and mining this um, resource? Yeah, so we do hear this a lot, this question of, you know, mining is done badly other places. Let's do it in Minnesota where we'll do it better. Uh, and which is of course premised on the notion that we will do it better, which honestly these proposals we've seen uh, in many cases, that's not at all clear. Like these proposals are just as polluting as they are in other places. Um, to hone in on this issue of cobalt specifically, cobalt mining in the Democratic Republic of Congo is um, really kind of horrific. Like Google cobalt mine in the DRC, if you dare. Uh, there are these terrible stories of children working in the mine that are killed and maimed. It is awful. And the company that owns a big chunk of one of those mines is Glencore. 
Glencore is also the main investor they own at this point, Polymet. And so the same company that's engaged in these uh, terrible business practices and massive violations of human rights in other places wants to mine here. And to me, I don't think we should be doing business with companies like that. I don't think we should validate their business model. I don't think we should allow them to profit. I think we have an obligation to turn them into an international pariah until they do better. If we support human rights and we oppose those practices, the best thing we can do is refuse to do business with companies that act in that way. And, you know, not only can the state of Minnesota do this, but we can do this as consumers. There are efforts to put pressure on these companies. There are some business coalitions that are looking to um, increase supply transparency to get it so that you know if the cobalt in a product, it came from, um, you know, a mine that respects human rights or a really terrible mine. Um, so it's good to support those coalitions and those companies. Um, and that's a good thing to do research on. Um, the other thing I want to say about this is that no amount of mining is going to fix this in Minnesota is going to fix this problem for a couple of reasons. One is that um, we don't have we ha have hardly ever any cobalt here. Um, so it's really trace amounts. The polymet mine, if it operated for 20 years as proposed, it would produce enough cobalt to get about 1% of the world's supply for one year. And so it's not, it's not going to change the like global market for cobalt. That mine and is still going to operate and still be problematic. We really need other strategies to get at that problem. Mining in Minnesota is going to really have no effect on that at all. Thanks. Um, and I see that there's a question here about um, sort of the federal interplay. Can the federal gov government come in and quash a project or could it approve a project that Minnesota didn't want? Can you talk a little bit about the role of the federal government in these mining proposals? Sure. So really, the federal government, other than for coal mining, doesn't have uh, rules and regulations that apply to the state. So it is a state by state situation. So we approve our mines based on our state law. And you might wonder, is our state law the best state law? Are we really the height of regulation? And the answer to that is no, but we don't have time to really go into that today. Um, so the federal government could get directly involved insofar as the federal permits are concerned. So there are permits that have to be issued by federal agencies. So here, for example, uh, the 100 acre swamp is going to be essentially removed by Polymet's uh, open pit mine and the US Army Corps of Engineers, a federal agency has to permit that. So that would be a role where the federal government could take an action through the Corps of Engineers and EPA, which works with the Corps of Engineers to say no, you know, or you need more, uh, uh, you know, you need to develop a better wetland a substitution plan for the uh, proposed destruction of these wetlands. So the federal government can't directly do it, but maybe indirectly would be the answer to that question. Great. Um, so unfortunately, I'm seeing that we are out of time. I, maybe I'll take one more question since we started a little bit late. Um, and folks obviously should feel free to drop off if you want to. Um, so there's a question about the uh, the permit term, does that also apply to the dam safety permit or is it just a permit to mine issue? So uh, one of the ironies of the PolyMed case was that at the very same time, the DNR was telling us it was essentially impossible to put a term on the permit to mine, they put a term on the dam safety permit. So there is a requirement to have a term, the dam safety permit had that term, but apparently it was impossible to do this for the permit to mine. So I don't think that helped you in our space. <laughs> right. All right, I think we're gonna have to leave it there. I wanna thank everybody for um, attending today. And if you do have more questions, feel free to reach out. And even better, you should join us this afternoon because we are celebrating these PolyMet wins um, from four to seven this afternoon at Highland Hills and everybody is welcome. It's a free event, family friendly. Um, there will be a food truck with pizza and a cash bar and ice cream and games for kids and all kinds of things. So if you can um, join us, that would be great. 
Also, um, think about signing up for our next CLE in this series. It's going to be November 4th, and we're going to be talking about MIRA, the Minnesota Environmental Rights Act. You can find information about all these events at our website, which is mncenter.org, mncenter.org. So thanks, Anne and Catherine, um, and thanks, everybody, for attending. Have a good day. Thanks, everybody.